Hello world, it's Craig. I know in my last video, I said I was done with this SCMP based nibbler system and that I was moving on to a new adventure with a new processor that I hadn't used before. But something has been keeping me up at night and that is the inability to do elegant breakpoints or single steps on this nibbler hardware. So I decided to keep this on the bench and hammer away at it to add some vector instructions to the system opcodes. Now, many processors have vector instructions or vector interrupts. When the processor executes a vector instruction, it usually first pushes the program counter onto the stack, and then it continues execution at a predetermined address. So for example, the 8080, the 8085 have vector instructions called restart instructions. And these are one byte instructions from restart zero to restart seven. When the processor executes a restart zero, it pushes the program counter so it can find its way back and then it jumps to the address 0000. Restart one and it goes to address 0008. Restart two is 0010 and so on with each destination address being eight above the last. And you can use these restarts in a number of ways. For example, if there's a routine that is called very frequently, say a print or a get character routine, rather than do a call, which is three bytes, you can use one of the restarts, which is like a call to this specific address. And then at that address, there can be a portion of the subroutine code and then a jump to the rest of that code for the subroutine. Or maybe you can even fit all of the subroutine code in either the eight bytes for that restart or you can use the eight bytes for the next restarts if you're not using those. Since the stack was pushed by the restart vector instruction, the subroutine just does a normal return but each time that routine is called, it saves two bytes by using the restart rather than using a call where you have to give it the address. Now, another way to use the restart is for diagnostic purposes. When working on a program, there can be a special diagnostic sequence that's triggered by that restart instruction. Maybe a breakpoint, for example. And you can watch my breakpoint video. It's a uh, you know, breakpoint like a boss, but basically during diagnostics, an instruction is replaced with the restart instruction. And that restart instruction then sends the program off to a breakpoint whenever that, re that instruction is executed. And when it's at that breakpoint, things can be examined, like all the registers can be examined or you can, you can change things. Then to continue the program, the restart instruction is removed and the original instruction is put back in and then the program counter is set to continue with that original instruction that was the breakpoint. So these restarts or more generally vector instructions have all sorts of uses. And going from the 8080 to the 8085, there were four additional hardware triggered restarts that are wedged in between the software restarts. And when a signal comes into one of these four hardware interrupts, it's the same as executing one of these restart instructions, but they're now numbered 5.5, 6.5, or 7.5 because their destination addresses are halfway in between the even numbered restarts. So 6.5 times eight is the address of the 6.5 hardware interrupt. Even if the processor doesn't have vector instructions, many boards included it. This is the solid state music S100 single board computer that we built some time ago. And it includes a vector restart, which jams a jump instruction onto the bus so the processor can begin execution code from addresses other than zero. So now let's look at this SCMP processor and see why it is so difficult to do something like a restart or a breakpoint. Well, there's no vector instructions in the SCMP like the restart instruction in the 8085. In fact, there isn't even a call instruction for that matter. There's a marginally useful hardware vector interrupt of sorts, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The scamp can just execute a jump instruction, but with the jump, the program counter is changed with no copy of where the program jumped from, so there's no going back. To emulate a call, the program first sets up one of the pointers to the destination instruction, well, one address before it actually. But once that destination address is ready to do the call, the XPPC or exchange pointer with program counter instruction then swaps the destination in that pointer, say P3, with the program counter. And now the old program counter is in P3 and what was in P3 is now the program counter and the processor is redirected with the next instruction being fetched from that destination address. 
the old program counter where we left is in the P3 pointer, so the routine can save that, or if it wants to, it can simply do another XPPC instruction, and it'll return back to where it was called. Now, it all happens just like a call and return to a subroutine, but setting up the destination address takes six bytes, and then the XPPC is another byte, so all totaled it's seven bytes to call a subroutine. It's annoying, but it's manageable in the code to go to a routine with this XPPC instruction. But it's impossible for us to use that as a breakpoint because to set up the breakpoint, rather than just replacing one byte, like using a vector instruction, seven bytes have to be replaced to set up the address of the breakpoint handler and issue the XPPC instruction. Now, of course, if we aren't using P3, we can just leave it at the breakpoint handler and then we can do it with one byte. But it's pretty restrictive to not be able to use P3 when we're writing our own code and we want to do single steps. So there's a number of issues with putting these seven bytes in. And one of the more obvious is, let's say the breakpoint is put in right after a conditional statement that skips one or two instructions. And maybe the conditional statement falls through and executes these new seven bytes. But maybe the conditional statement jumps over that original instruction and now the program counter lands in the middle of those seven byte destination configuration code. And if the program was working before, it certainly isn't working now. So what about that hardware interrupt that the scamp has? Is there a way that it can be used? It's the same problem because all that hardware interrupt does is issue the XPPC instruction. So whatever is MP3 when that interrupt comes in is now the program counter. So to use that hardware interrupt, P3 has to be configured just like it was before. And then the interrupt enabled and the system continues operation until the interrupt comes in or the interrupt is disabled so that P3 can be used for something else. So we can turn on and turn off that interrupt, but P3 still has to be tied to that one purpose. And if the scamp had another pointer or two, this wouldn't be such a big issue, but it's already pointer limited and dedicating P3 to that interrupt certainly hobbles the programmer. Now, finally, there is that halt instruction, which like many things scamp doesn't do what you would expect it to do. All halt really does is flip a bit in the status nibble. Now that can be captured and used with external hardware to perform a halt. Halt is a one byte instruction. And for a while I entertained the thought of using that as a means of single stepping. In fact, I built up this backplane that has some circuitry on it to capture that halt. This left switch, for example, we can either disable or we can enable looking at that halt instruction. And if it's enabled, if a halt comes along, the processor stops. Then this LED turns on and the system waits until this button releases it from that halt. I also tied it the override to a external signal or the processor board can also disable that halt if it wants to, but that really didn't give me much more capability. Now this board can also put the processor into a single step and then it progresses either by a single instruction or a single cycle. And then this button releases it from that step so it can continue into the next cycle. So here we're just going through cycle steps. Over here, we're going through instruction steps. And I've been playing around and trying different things with this backplane, but I just can't figure out a way to get it to do all the things I want. The single step is nice and it's useful, but without the ability to go in and look at the registers, it's really only useful along with the logic analyzer, or maybe if I made some sort of a bus monitor board. And that would give us the addresses at least, but we couldn't see the internal register still. So I'm finally getting around to what we're going to do in this video. I gave up on this backplane, has been much help and I decided to start another aspect of this Nibbler project from scratch. Now the SCMP processor and specifically this Nibbler system desperately needs some vector instructions and maybe even a hardware vector interrupt. So let's add a few vector instruction opcodes to this SCAMP system as well as a hardware vector interrupt. Now to add these new opcodes, I hereby decree that there shall be four new instructions for the system. I'm gonna call them vector instructions C, V, I, D, E, and F. 
and the mnemonic will be VI, and the operand will be the hex value from C to F to tell us which vector instruction it is. Now, these will be a single byte instruction, and the assembler will see that VIC, and it will convert it to an opcode. Let's say the operand becomes the lowest bits, and then the high nibble will be all zeros. So the assembler sees a VIC, and it'll give us the machine instruction 0C. And then the other ones will be the same. When they're assembled, the machine instructions will be 0C, 0D, 0E, and 0F. Now, by using these one-byte instructions, the program counter will be directed to one of four specific addresses. And I'm going to go one better than the 8080, and rather than these addresses being only eight bytes apart, I'm going to space them 16 bytes apart so there's more room to get things done because after all, the scamp always takes more instructions to get anything done. Now we need to pick some landing addresses. This could be anywhere, but to keep them out of the way, I'm gonna put them at higher memory than Intel did. So let's land at FC0, FD0, FE0, and FF0. And finally, I'm going to make the highest one of these, vector instruction F, serve dual purpose so it can also be a hardware, a hardwired vectored interrupt. When a hardware signal comes in, the processor will be vectored to that address I just gave, FF0, where the programmer will have 16 bytes to do whatever they need to do when that interrupt comes in. And I think that's pretty much it. With this decree, we can now use the vector instruction for the things the code does the most, like the Gecko routine and the put, C, the put C routine. And rather than set up P3 and do an XPPC, that can be reduced to just a one byte vector instruction. Now also to add a breakpoint, we can replace any opcode with the opcode for this single byte vector instruction, which will send the program to that breakpoint manager at that address. So just think of how nice that will be. Now, of course, we cannot set those new opcodes in the processor itself. So there is still the minor detail of adding all of this to an existing SCAMP system. But believe it or not, this is one of the oldest problems in microprocessors, and the solution is as old as the 4004 itself. And while there needs to be some accommodations for the complexities of the SCAMP, or I guess maybe it's the simplicity of the scamp. The solution is that it has always been, and that is to jam instructions onto the bus. Now there's chips that do this for a lot of systems, but we're gonna have to make this from scratch for this scamp. So it's gonna work like this. There's gonna be a bus sniffer circuit that monitors the data bus for instructions. And those are the instructions that the scamp is fetching from memory. And when the sniffer sees the CPU loading one of our vector instructions, it's going to trigger the bus jammer circuit. And then when the CPU goes to read the next instruction from memory, this jammer circuit is going to jam our instruction onto the bus to replace whatever the instruction the processor was going to fetch from memory. And that jammed instruction is going to be whatever instruction that is our first vector address. So for example, if the sniffer saw the instruction was VIC, the jammer will give the CPU whatever instruction we have in at that address FC0. And then the CPU is going to execute our instruction that's at FC0, and it'll continue with a fetch of the next instruction. But again, the jammer will replace whatever instruction is pointed to by the program counter that the CPU put out. It's going to replace that instruction with the instruction from the second of our vector addresses and so on. And the jammer is going to have 16 addresses that'll override whatever the processor would have normally fetched from memory. Now, typically, we would just change the program counter with those first few instructions, but we have a lot of overhead we have to do with the scamp. And we're going to have those 16 addresses because that's just enough to save everything so the monitor can eventually return back to the breakpoint as if nothing happened. Now, that's enough for this video. I think we need to let this ruminate a bit because the deeper I get into it, the more special issues I see in the SCMP. And the highest priority of this project is that just like running the Kitbug monitor I talked about in an earlier video, we want to be able to switch back and forth between the user's code and our monitor code. But now instead of using the commands in Kitbug, which has some issues, we're going to do that through hardware. 
and we have to be able to switch back and forth without destroying any registers or the program counter. In fact, this system needs to save both P3 and the program counter because now they'll be completely independent, not just on opposite sides of that XPPC instruction like they are when we're using Kitbug. Then when returning to the program, it needs to restore them both independently of each other. And these are all very subtle things and just lots of details that need to be worked out to get this thing to work properly. Now, if you want some more inspiration, I was actually able to just pick one of these up. This is National Semiconductor's low-cost development system, the LCDS. And this system has some built-in circuits that allow the user to operate their application board in a single-step manner and let you examine registers in between. But I think I can do some one-upmanship and come up with a better system that gives us more capabilities and more options and specifically allow it to be used with this Nibbler system. All right, well, thanks for watching. We'll dig into the gory details of the system requirements and the design in the next video. And in the meantime, please remember that this channel is not monetized and is entirely powered by likes, shares, and viewer engagement. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.